What up, boys and ghouls? Welcome back to r slash no sleep, where I read creepy, scary, and downright messed up stories. Today's episode mentions themes of blood, hallucinations, and the loss of a loved one. If you'd like to support this podcast, please follow, like, and subscribe. The ghost in the garden won't leave me alone. Years after Todd started haunting me, the garden was loud. The wind gripped the branches of my old oak and slammed them against each other, turning the leaves into drums. The gravel of the path crunching under my flight sounded like fireworks. The birds were screaming. It wasn't as loud as the year Tom died, but it was more aggressive. The noises were angry. I went to a group therapy session on the anniversary of Todd's death. I couldn't handle the noise. It wasn't getting any better. All those griefs were suffocating. When I left the room, I saw three women outside the door. They could have been friends, or sisters, or polyamorous trio. I don't know, but it it doesn't matter anyway. They were gripping each other desperately. Their bodies so close together, they were almost running together. If Todd was here, I would hold him like that. You know... I used to be so angry at you, Todd said. The blue button-up he wore was rumpled and stained, one collar standing up. There was a ragged hole on the left side of the shirt, and I knew there was a matching hole on the back. Why? I whispered. My therapist had told me not to talk to him, over and over. My therapist had chipmunk-sized front teeth and every time I had a session with her, I was transfixed by them. I stared at her teeth, and I ignored her advice. You name me Todd. It's such a basic name. I wish you had chosen something more... creative. (laughs) As he grinned at me, a thin stream of blood dripped out of his ear. It made no sound as it hit the ground and soaked into the grass. It's okay, though. I know you're only doing your best. Thank you, Todd, I said woodenly. I very determinedly did not look at his ear. I love you, Mom. I've always loved you. He said it in a very matter-of-fact voice. At some point, a piece of straw appeared in his mouth, and he chewed on it like a cowboy in one of those trashy westerns he used to love. I felt my eyes watering, and I took out the travel pack tissues from my pocket. It was almost empty, but... I pulled out the last two tissues and wiped my eyes. I've been a continually leaking faucet over the last five years, and by that point, tears were just an eventuality to plan for. Of course, Mom, he said. I closed my eyes to wipe them. I pressed hard against my eyelids until red crept in from the sides and danced across my irises. When I opened them again, he was sitting in the grass, Innocent as you please. In the space of a couple seconds, he had turned small and chubby, his only words indiscernible babbling. I laughed. Well, I felt the laugh. Deep down, but it dissolved in my stomach acid and was long gone before it got to my throat. It was such a Todd thing to do, obeying my order not to talk in the most absurd way possible. Todd had been a cute baby when he was alive, and that didn't change when he died. This hallucination, this ghost, or whatever it was, impersonating my dead son, had gotten him almost perfectly right, down to the little wisp of hair sticking from his skull, and the way he had sucked on his knuckles as a baby. But he was never this nice to me. He was 17 when he died, and teenagers are not notorious for telling their parents about love. Every time he appeared, every time he said something sweet, it broke the illusion that Todd, the real Todd, was waiting for me in the living room, with his phone in one hand and a horrendously unhealthy snack in the other. 
I was crying hard enough that my nose was blocked, and I was out of tissues again. So I blew my nose into the grass and went inside, leaving Todd to crawl around alone. By the time I passed the abandoned car in the middle of my garden, he had disappeared. I stuck my head under cold water until the redness in my eyes went away. I'd gotten rather good at it over the last five years. Too long under the water and the cold irritates your eyes more. Too short and the puffiness won't go down. Tell me a story. Tell me a story, Todd said. He was eight or nine, that straw still stuck in his lips. I ignored him. Or just talk to me. It doesn't have to be a story. I left the faucet on and dried my hands on a towel. Hey, you can tell me about the car in the garden. My hands were dry, so I put them under the water again. He was using his wheedling voice. Come on, you love the garden. I rubbed the towel against my wrist until the skin was raw. Please, 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 please. Fine. Really? Yes. This Todd was hard to resist. All floppy-haired and puppy-eyed. Wearing a Minecraft shirt that was two sizes too small. There is a tree in the car in my garden. I told him about raising the oak. Fifteen years old when I got it, still scrawny. Guiding its trunk through a window and then out the sunroof. I talked about the flowers filling the seats and the floor and the vines hanging down around the trunk. Throughout, he watched me intently, his gaze never moving away from my face. Thank you for telling me about that, Mom, he said solemnly. You're welcome. My smile was a small, sharp thing, but it was there, and it was hard worn. When Todd died, my garden died with him. His death filled it with thorns and weeds, left my oak dried and leafless. The last time I was in it was the night that Todd died. I gave the car that he died in to the garden, and the thorns grew up around it almost overnight. I got home from the hospital and suddenly pricker bushes were taking over my lilies, thorny vines choking everything out. When Todd was a baby, his clothes were constantly getting dirty. I would come in from working outside to change him, and even if I scrubbed my hands for minutes before touching him, the dirt under my fingernails and in the crevices of my palms somehow found its way onto his skin. When he got older, he helped me. No matter how much I told him there wasn't much difference, he always claimed that Lemnisera periclimenum was the sweetest of all the honeysuckle species. The honeysuckles were overwhelmed first. They were gone before I got back from the hospital. In the hospital, there was a clean, white bandage wrapped around his head. And not a drop of blood anywhere in sight. It was too clean. When the hospital called me and told me that my son was in a medically induced coma, in critical condition, I had not expected this. I thought there would be bits of flesh everywhere and the overpowering smell of rot. Instead, there were clean bandages and the faint smell of cleaning products. Todd refused to go to sleep without a story until the age of ten. And he always insisted that we go out into the garden to read it. I opened the storybook across my knees. There once was a girl who lived in a cave, deep underground. Her village was made of many rooms, all carved directly into the rock. It was always dark. I told him about the plants, the many plants that her people tended and saw as holy. I told him about the tunnel, steep and pitted with traps, and the girl who went up the tunnel one day, when everyone was asleep. I thought he shifted when I described the top of the tunnel, and the man, far away, herding strange, skinny livestock. The alarm started beeping before I got to the end. Over the sounds of nurses moving around the room, I yelled about animals scraping their teeth over the dirt, 
rocks crunching in their teeth. People started moving around the room. There was one nurse who held Todd's hand as he looked over the machines. He was kind when he kicked me out of the room. When a doctor came to see me 45 minutes later, her face was carefully grave. She told me about Todd's sudden drop in brain activity in a polite, professional voice. She spewed her scripted sympathy at me far too long before she got the message and left me alone. She watched the man for a long time, but he just stood among his cattle, still as a corpse, I whispered, standing in the hallway outside his room. I didn't feel anything except a vague disappointment that I hadn't gotten to finish the story. By the time I got home, the thorns were everywhere. The car in my garden is now covered in leaves and vines and earth. If you didn't know what it was, you would think it's just a mound of dirt. Todd leaned against the fence, a broad straw hat on his head to match the straw in his mouth. The blood had moved from his ear, pooling around the tear in his shirt and splattering across his cheeks. Tell me a story, Mom. Tell me about how the car got here. You know what happened, Todd. Then tell me again. Please, Mom. After you died, I drove it here and left it. My voice didn't waver on the word died, and I counted that as a personal victory. Todd disappeared. He had gotten what he came for. I was thinking about it now. He just didn't want me to forget. I didn't want to forget. After Todd died, after all the doctors left and the only thing left to do was pick out a coffin, I went to find his van. It looked the same from the back. The paint wasn't so much as scratched. The windshield was shattered, but someone had cleaned the glass out of the inside. They said the accident was no one's fault. That a piece of metal had cracked away from a building to the right. Inevitable, they said. With how much wind we've been having? That metal crashed through the windshield and right into Todd's chest. Regrettable, he said. He was so young. Most of the blood stains were concentrated on the leather of the driver's seat and the dashboard. I got into the van and put my hand over a spot of blood on the steering wheel. I kept to the speed limit all the way home. I turned down the gravel road that led to my house. I was driving the car one-handed, my fingers still clenched over the blood on the wheel. The needle of the speedometer strained further and further to the right. The end of the path was ahead, with my garden ahead. Old growth trees lined around the edges of my yard. I didn't slow down. The car hit the edge of the path and narrowly avoided hitting a tree. I didn't slow down. I was properly in my garden then. Flowers splayed out over the windshield and vines trying to tangle around the wheels. The muddy ground made the car spin around, and I lost my momentum. I pushed the gas pedal down harder, and I was already at the other side of my garden. And the car was caught between two oaks, their trunks squeezing the hood on either side. I got out of the car and walked back to the street, using the furrows of squished plants as a path. Todd was better than me with tomatoes. I never knew when to pick them. They would end up on the table sour, or they would squish disgustingly between my fingers. He claimed it was all about the surface tension. He threw a tomato at me once, like a snowball. The surface tension of his perfectly ripe tomato kept it from breaking open, and it just bounced off my shirt. The tomato I threw back at him was rotten and oozing. <laughs> it splattered across his face, and, of course, after that, he accused me of cheating. While he was doing that, I threw another one at him. He got down off his cheating soapbox real quick to find an appropriately disgusting tomato for me. At first, Todd was just a whisper at the back of my head. A comforting voice telling me that everything was going to be okay. It wasn't even him. At first. It was my voice. My subconscious. My fault. 
I believed that voice at first. I believed that he would come back. But as the days went on and Todd stayed dead and I stopped hoping. Until one day, Todd appeared in my kitchen. And I didn't care that he wasn't real. In the days before New Year's Eve, the illusion stopped being enough. We lurked around each other, me and the illusion. I sat in the living room, watching the old TV sputter along on its ramshackle shelf. And he watched me, and the silence pressed down as hard as it had in those first months. My garden froze on New Year's Eve. The car lurked at the edge of the yard, as usual, except instead of being covered with a curtain of greenery, there was just skeletal branches and frozen leaves. Todd was sitting in the brown grass next to it. Why am I here, Mom? He sounded exhausted, and when he looked at me, there was blood running down his face. I was staring in shock at the destruction of my garden, but at his words I spun around and jabbed a finger at him. You! I don't want you here! You won't go away! Todd was flickering between ages and outfits, like an old light bulb and for long moments his muscles seemed to be woven together with vines. When he spoke, his voice sounded like mine. I love you. Everything is going to be okay. When his face was overwhelmed by vines and he stopped looking like Todd, I spoke. I don't believe you. I am you. His voice was almost mocking for a moment, before suddenly he pulled back together, into Todd as an eight-year-old. Tell me a story, Mom. I closed my eyes and listened to the birds. They sounded very far away. In my head, my therapist ranted about her healthy coping mechanisms through her chipmunk teeth. The trip back down to her cave was easy, I whispered. For a second, Tom flickered. There was an outline of a hospital gown. White bandages there, and then... gone. The girl who lived beneath the world slid down the tunnel like a slide, and soon ended up back home. The story was old, almost forgotten and I grasped the edges of it with difficulty. Todd's straw had left its mouth and threaded between his fingers as I told him about the girl who came home and wept in sadness for what she had seen in the world above. As she called her people to action, beseeched them to come above and help those on the surface, the wound in his chest leaked blood. I described the villagers digging up their plants and making the long trek back to the surface. I couldn't say when it happened, but the ground around us smelled like a hospital. I could hear the quiet beeping and subdued chatter that had infiltrated Todd's final moments. And I told him the rest of the story. I narrated the grief of the girl as they had to leave some of their plants behind and the difficult climb through the tunnel. When I described the awe the girl and her village felt at seeing the surface, Todd was no longer moving, and the vines had so enveloped him that it was hard to delineate him from the shrubbery around us. The surface dwellers helped the girl and her people dig below the hard crust into the good soil below. They put down their plants in neat rows, and no one had to live beneath the ground ever again. Thank you for the story, Mom, he whispered in my head, his voice like the wind. Todd faded into the undergrowth and was gone. I don't know if he was ever really there at all. Thanks for listening, boys and ghouls. I hope you found this story as creepy as I did. 
Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification button so you get updates for the newest daily creepy story. As always, the author of this story will be credited in the description. Feel free to send them some love over on Reddit, and I'll see you on the other side.